this is an intimidation that, um, effort to silence people, to threaten them, to, to keep them fearful. If you remember during the waning months of the election, the narrative was if you vote for Trump, you're going to lose your job. If you vote for Trump, you're going to be deemed a racist and lose your job. It was all about threatening people's lives, their livelihoods, and beating them into submission. So you can't beat them by threatening their pocketbooks. You can threaten them with their liberty and um, and concoct uh, a scenario like they like they apparently have done about January 6th. Like I said, I have no idea what will happen on January 6th, but I'm going by what I saw by Tucker Carlson and this uh, very disturbing article in The Revolver about uh, the FBI essentially organizing the event. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. A date which will live in infamy. I still have a dream. Good night and good luck. How's it going, man? Chase, how's good. It going? How are how are you doing? Thanks for um, making this work, man. I know it's late, and you probably want to spend time with your wife. Uh, but oh, I appreciate you making this work. You know what? I I had promised you, and I'm a man of my word. You know, so uh, just scheduling wise, we've been all over the place. And uh, but I told her uh, right before dinner, I I have a thing to do here, so let's. I'm happy to do it. So thanks for having me. Well, I appreciate it. The first thing I want to ask before we get started with your book is do you think the FBI was behind January 6th? Well, I, I saw the, um, the Tucker Carlson piece and the revolver piece, and it's shocking to say the least. And nothing at this point surprises me uh, regarding um, you know, some of these uh, rumors or analyses or reporting that has come out because I mean, you've read the you've read my book. I mean, you've been following what's going around the country the last uh, four years, ever since Trump uh, was inaugurated, and it's just uh, a continuous assault and a weaponization of uh, the federal government against outsiders. So, so yeah, I just uh, I just was watching the uh, reporting, and it's just shocking to say the least. Obviously, and uh, I'm holding my breath like everybody else as I get to the bottom of what really happened because it's so disgusting and disturbing. Yeah. So it seems like based on um, what I read in your book, it seems like the intelligence community really had it out in an intentional way for the Trump campaign. Is this something that happens every election cycle and we just don't know it? Or is this, do you think this is the first time that this has been the case? Uh, I, I uh, look, I believe there are global interests every four years that coincide with the most highly contested and watched events in the world. And that's not the Super Bowl. It's not the World Cup. It's not the Olympics. It's the U.S. presidential campaign season. Every country around the world has an interest of some nature in who is or is not elected the president of the United States of America. 2016, on the other hand, just happened to up the standards and uh, the tensions regarding the next president, because obviously Clinton was supposed to be Obama's third term. You had a lot of outsiders who I worked for, uh, as you and your viewers know, I worked for Ben Carson first, and then I worked for Trump, and both of them were deemed as outsiders, and um, they just were not um, candidates for potential presidential material for many of these globalist agendas and the people that uh, were running into me and Mike Flynn and uh, uh, even, I guess, um, you know, Trump's campaign as a whole were all connected to the Clintons in one way or another. They were connected to the Clinton Foundation, the socialist groups in um, Europe, in Australia. Uh, it was all just this concerted effort by this um, global agenda that was tied into the Clintons to destroy an, an incipient America first, uh, nationalistic, populist movement before it could emerge into what it later became, which was the America first movement, which then reverberated throughout the entire world. As you saw, Brexit happened in the UK. As you've read in the book, the Brexit issue was a very important element that the British establishment um, was hostile towards. They, they hated that um, there was a candidate who was so overtly supportive 
of a thing like Brexit because that would actually galvanize the groups in the UK to have the strength and the courage to go forward with this momentous decision to get out of Europe, to regain control of their borders and to essentially govern themselves by the British for the British. And this was something that obviously um, people like David Cameron, who was the prime minister at the time, and all of his ministers who were, uh, you know, recording conversations with me or or uh, threatening me about Trump did not want. And um, I, I guess the, that's uh, the long answer to your uh, question is that I certainly believe that every, that when there are um, factors at play, like we were discussing in, in 2016, at such a crucial moment that would either unleash the nationalist movement around the world or destroy it, I, I saw it with my own eyes and we've been living this uh, weaponization of the intel agencies for years now. Uh, they couldn't stop us in 2016, so then they had to get Mueller appointed to catch Trump in an obstruction issue, which of course he uh, uh, escaped from because he never, you know, obstructed something when you're being framed, and then an impeachment, and now this insurrection nonsense. So it's just a continuous uh, witch hunt, and um, they're not going to stop until uh, they uh, beat this uh, nationalist movement into the ground, and that's exactly what I fear. And why I think people uh, like Tucker Carlson, shows like yours, who want the truth and need to um, highlight these facts that the American people are so important, because a lot of the mainstream media is afraid to actually re report on this stuff. Uh, we remember what happened with uh, Dominion, where they're sending out billion dollar lawsuits just because some pundits on TV were questioning the election and the various um uh, you know, uh, fraudulent, uh, you know, aspects to it, which are now being audited in numerous states. So um, it's, a, it's a massive scare tactic. People are rotting in prison right now. And Tucker Carlson has been great about this on, on his show. He's actually highlighting the plight of so many of these individuals who are just rotting away in prison without actually understanding what happened. And now there's questions that the FBI actually had informants and uh, were running this entire thing. So um, you know, uh, right now, I, I, I guess I speak for many Republicans where they feel that they are being um, hunted. Mm -hmm. I feel that Republicans in many ways feel that they are under threat, not just for their jobs and their livelihoods, but their freedom, essentially, if they just speak out in support of an agenda that uh, right now, I guess, is, is wokeism or socialism or communism. So that's, I guess, a very... Uh, ge my general ideas on the status of the country and how 2016 um, has led to where we are now. We saw a little bit of that attitude um, from the Obama administration with um, obviously the, um, I believe it was Eric Holder uh, in terms of auditing conservative um, political action committees and groups disproportionately. Um, and, and so that's kind of, it lines up with what happened to you and your awesome book, by the way, which I'll hold up here, uh, uh, deep state target. It was, um, an awesome read. I did actually read it. Um, and I, what, what was really profound to me reading it is, is how so much of it felt like you were just being set up and I couldn't figure out, and I know at the end of the book, you kind of talk about some of the incentives, but why do you think it is that they were, do you feel like you were set up or entrapped? And, and why do you think it is specifically that they wanted to undermine you and the Trump campaign uh, from an intelligence community standpoint? Because one would think or hope that the intelligence community doesn't care who the president is. They just do the best they can to protect national security, no matter what administration gets elected. But this, we see a heavy hand of a manipulation to try to kind of steer the campaign in, uh, in, in favor of the, uh, the Clinton administration. Yeah, well, look, there, there's been tremendous disinformation and misinformation out there about uh, my actual role with Trump's campaign and how I got involved or, you know, did I fall from the sky and I just got lucky or something? You know, there's been so much misunderstanding. And that's why I, I did write my book, because the book does highlight a lot of the background that started um, a lot of this setup against me. It wasn't a spontaneous setup. I mean, I'll give you an example. Um when Trump met Egypt's president at the UN General Assembly as one of the two leaders that he met during the campaign, I was the one that brokered that meeting. I just was a younger person on the campaign who had a lot of my contacts, and I didn't want to present myself on national television. The campaign wanted me to go on CNN constantly. They wanted me all over. I gave some interviews. If you Google 
Um, some interviews I gave with the Times of London in the UK. I gave ones to the Russian media. I think I was actually the only campaign member that was authorized to talk to Russian media during that time. So I tried to keep a relatively um, uh, mild or, you know, uh, not, not too public, um, you know, position on the campaign just for my own reasons at that time as a, you know, I think I was a 28, 29 years old. And uh, that backfired because when a lot of this stuff happened and my name went public, there were a lot of bozos and people that just didn't know who I was or they themselves were not part of the campaign that were just spreading misinformation about me, lies, making it look like something it wasn't. And in my opinion, I think we're coordinating with those nefarious actors that wanted to undermine and overthrow Trump. Um, but besides that, uh, what, what my background is in a nutshell was I, I was working in very uh, establishment politics in D.C. with a lot of George W. Bush type of Republicans, the Reagan types, the establishment crowd. And I got tired of working with them. I was working on very sensitive energy projects in D.C. with um, regarding Israel and uh, the natural gas discoveries there over the last 10 years and how that fit into um, the U.S foreign policy posture. And we were promoting an agenda that the, Ob that the Obama administration did not want. And it, I'll just summarize a very complicated uh, story very simply. Obama wanted Turkey to be the head and the center of power in the Middle East, while the agenda that we were promoting wanted to align Israel with Greece and Egypt and some other countries in that part of the world. And what happened was, while I was working in D.C., I later learned that I was being spied on. This was something I learned when Mueller and all these uh, people uh, ran into my life years after the fact. And that target followed me. And as you, and if you read the book, you'll understand uh, the moment I joined Trump's campaign, uh, before my name is even public in the Washington Post, I'm having the foreign minister of Italy uh, introducing me to this infamous Joseph Mifsud in Rome at a school that we later found out the CIA trains at. So clearly, there was a this target was following me while I was on Carson's campaign. I joined Trump's campaign, and I think it was at that point that they were really looking to handcuff the presumptive nominee of the GOP, which was going to be Trump, and that's why they had to go out of their way and actually entrap me or set me up in these elaborate schemes uh, with money or women or recordings. I mean, you name it. Good for you, you know. not taking the bait on the uh, honeypot. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it was just one of these insane, uh, one of many scenarios that they went out of their way. I mean, it, it, it's one thing if there's, a, if there's criminal activity, right? And then somebody wants to investigate that. It's another when the government is, a, is orchestrating a scenario around somebody to make it look like they are up to no good. And that's something that uh, it happened to Richard Jewell uh, during the, mm -hmm. uh, the Atlanta issue, as we all know, that very disturbing uh, case of the FBI uh, trying to destroy somebody's life by framing them as, a, as something that they're not in order to get their man, as they like to say. We saw it with General Flynn. We saw it with others um, who were basically entrapped. And it's something that I think when you see people like Andy McCabe or, or Peter Strzok going publicly and laughing about it and the media coddling them, you know, there are 75 to 80 million Americans out there, maybe even a handful of Democrats who are questioning this and, and are frightened that the federal government can have that type of superpower to try and, uh, you know, eavesdrop or spy or destroy people's lives with actually no other intent in place except to essentially rewrite history or undo an election. And I think that's why Durham is so important. I think that's why, um, uh, and I've talked about this a bit, I think Durham is a real deal. I don't think this is somebody who's uh, collecting a paycheck and sitting around doing nothing. I know who he's interviewed, the key actors he's interviewed go back to October of 2019. And I think he's waiting for the right moment. I think it's gonna coincide with the audits. Uh, just today, as we're talking right now, um, there was a new breaking story about the Steele dossier and how the FBI knew it goes, it was fraudulent even before the first uh, FISA warrant. So there's a lot of information that started to trickle out along with the audit in Arizona. And I think it's going to coincide very soon. I think this summer we're going to have uh, bombshell developments 
regarding uh, who at the FBI uh, was part of this conspiracy. And uh, they're going to be indicted, just like the FBI lawyer, uh, Kleinsmith, was oh, about a year ago, except I think he's going to go a lot higher than that. And uh, Biden is just not doing himself any favors. He's completely incompetent. He's corrupted. And uh, he weakens America from within and abroad. So I think uh, there are a lot of interests um, in assuring that he himself does not do more damage in America than he already has. And um, I think uh, we're, we're going to start seeing a lot more. So it seems to me that one of the vulnerabilities we have in the United States is that the intelligence community, given the nature of its work, is um, unmonitored and highly, highly secret. Um, uh, because it's necessary in order to um, uh, work efficiently and productively in, in terms of in actual intelligence. But how, how do we hold the FBI or the CIA or just the intelligence community in general, how do we hold them accountable moving forward? Because it seems like we just kind of got lucky that we got that, that we kind of caught them in their lies this time, you know? <laughs> so, so what's to stop them from doing this again, every single cycle. <laughs> Chase, that's a great, uh, and you know, I always say it, and I'm going to say it to you and your listeners as well. If it wasn't for my then girlfriend and now wife um, going out of her way before we were, we were even married and actually speaking about my case and um, supporting me publicly and, and allowing the American viewers uh, and the media itself to hear a different perspective um, about a lot of like the spying and the characters involved. I, I don't know where we would have been as a country right now, because, yeah, you're right. We did catch them because Trump won. But um, don't forget, Trump was on defense when Mueller was uh, appointed, uh, quote unquote, spontaneously. He was on defense. There wasn't much he could do, even if we knew. And it was only when the narrative shifted to Spygate and we started learning about these nefarious people like Stefan Halper. Most of your viewers and you will know who this person is where his name was revealed as somebody who was wiretapping me and uh, Carter Page and Michael Flynn. And uh, he was involved with that uh, Russian academic Svetlana Lokova in London. And uh, he was basically spreading lies about Michael Flynn and myself um, that Trump finally said my campaign was spied on. And that moment, I believe there was the first article that came out by uh, a great journalist and uh, somebody who I think uh, made his name off of uh, that article came from Chuck Ross at the Daily Caller. And I think the, the article is actually uh, on his pinned uh, profile on, on Twitter regarding this person. I think it was in March of 2018. And it was only then that Trump started saying that my campaign was spied on. The media was taking a different look at things because to send informants at a presidential campaign is a big deal. But at that time, we didn't understand how illegal it was. You know, the FBI started saying, oh, because we had probable cause, we had this. And now the lawyer who was at the center of the entire investigation, Kevin Kleinsmith, is being indicted for falsifying documents. So we've come a long way <laughs> from where we began on defense to now, where I think Republicans as a whole should be on offense regarding this particular issue. So what I think we really need to do is if we want to prevent this from ever happening again, and that says we need to hold these actors accountable. They have to be indicted. Uh, people have to be educated on the facts too. Uh, and they have to understand who was involved, why they were involved. And people in the media have to keep their foot um, on the pedal, getting this out there. Because if it becomes yesterday's news with all the news cycle changing and with uh, COVID and lockdowns and Biden stumbles, people are going to forget how big of a disaster this was and what a big impact it could have had if things had just gone a little different. So that's uh, something I guess uh, I would summarize it as people have to be held accountable, but um, uh, Americans and people who love this country have to be knowledgeable of the facts and keep members of Congress abreast of what happened. And hopefully if uh, the Republicans take back Congress next year, we could have real hearings uh, with Durham and full transparency and finally close this dark chapter in American history. Do you feel as if you're still being um, monitored by the intelligence community? I think, um, look, uh, grandmothers and MAGA moms and MAGA soccer moms are being, are being monitored, you know, and they're having their pictures blasted all over social media by the, you know, the FBI's Twitter account. And um, uh, it's not just me, I think. I mean, I, I presume I am. And I mean, I, 
I, I don't think I've done anything wrong, but uh, I don't think many people thought they did anything wrong. But uh, this is just the state of affairs in this country right now. There's a this is an intimidation um, effort to silence people, to threaten them, to to keep them fearful. If you remember during the waning months of the election, the narrative was if you vote for Trump, you're going to lose your job. If you vote for Trump, you're going to be deemed a racist and lose your job. It was all about threatening people's lives, their livelihoods, and beating them into submission. So you can't beat them by threatening their pocketbooks. You can threaten them with their liberty and um, and concoct uh, a scenario like they like they apparently have done about January 6th. Like I said, I have no idea what will happen on January 6th, but I'm going by what I saw by Tucker Carlson and this uh, very disturbing article in The Revolver about uh, the FBI essentially organizing the event. And that's uh, something that uh, I don't even think they do in Banana Republic is, uh, in 2021. Yeah, it's really interesting. It makes you wonder about what really happened to um, JFK, given that he seemed to be rather antagonistic to the the man behind the cat, and you, and uh, it makes you wonder if uh, the intelligence community had anything to do with that. I'm not um, much of a conspiracy theorist, but it seems to, just as reasonable as the official narrative. Um, uh, so that's very interesting. So I know that you unfortunately had to spend some time um, uh, in in uh, incarcerated. Uh, and that you got out on December 7th, the day which will live in infamy. And, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, what, what are you working on now? Uh, obviously, your book just came out. What's next for you? Yeah, no. So, uh, so I'm, I'm very um, vocal on TV now. And uh, I'm going to be likely continuing that effort and uh, just taking life one step at a time right now. We're, I'm going to wait and see right now and see where Durham comes, what happens with that. And uh, what kind of impact um, what we're talking about here today is going to really have on a lot of events moving forward. And then I think the natural course of life is going to take its place uh, with that, because um, one thing I have learned, uh, Chase, and for all your viewers out there, is that life is unpredictable. You can have an entire um, path, uh, you know, organized in your mind, and then life can change in a blink of an eye. So taking it one step at a time right now, life is very good right now. But, um, you know, trying to stay as active as possible and inform people, educate people like we're doing here on your program and, um, you know, getting behind some very interesting candidates. I think in 2022, I think uh, this is a very important election in the midterms, uh, not only for Durham, but actually for just the state of the country and the economy and how, you know, government is going to intervene in people's lives or not. So I'm going to be looking at a lot of America first candidates and see who I like, who I don't and um, get behind them and just stay publicly active in public service like so many people can. And that's something I recommend a lot of people do. If you can't be active in public service, you know, do something to get back to your country because we all have lived through a rough year and this country uh, needs all of our collective effort to get on the right track again, so. Great, so again, just before we get offline, um, I wanna mention your book. It was great, I did actually read it. Um, Thank you. And I know, I know that you, um, if someone uh, DMs you on Twitter, you'll send a, uh, a signed copy. So I highly recommend people do that. I did that. And um, even included a quote by Cicero in there too, which I really enjoyed. Um, where can people find you uh, in order to follow you and, 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 and keep up with the story? Sure. So I'm on Twitter. Uh, it's my main platform right now. Uh, it's at George Papa 19. And I'm on Facebook. I don't use Facebook as much. I basically copy and paste my Twitter stuff on there. I don't know how active people are on Facebook these days, but uh, that's uh, where you can find me. I'm on Newsmax a lot these days. You can see me on Newsmax two or three times a week if people watch Newsmax, uh, which is doing a great job, I think, as a counter to what Fox has, um, you know, unfortunately uh, tilted towards. And, uh, you know, people can always uh, stay in touch uh, via Twitter. It's a great platform. Well, I appreciate you taking the time to hop on with me um, uh, so late at night. Um, and thank you to your wife as well for letting you come uh, on the show. And uh, I'll let you go and get back to your family. Uh, thanks so much. And we'll be in touch. Excellent, Chase. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. A date which will live in infamy. I still have a dream. Good night and good luck.